Question one, please. Forms made by my department in response to the Mills review are as follows. Our complaint, waste, our complaint waste sector is now a corporate priority for the department, and a comprehensive operational waste strategy has been developed. Structural change has been implemented with the creation of a new single directorate with NIA, bringing together existing regulatory and enforcement teams, along with a new intelligence unit, a joint local and central government waste working group has been established with local councils to support more effective handling of municipal wastes, and staff skills and professional development has been improved with a robust induction and technical development framework in place. The regulatory reforms made by the Department in response to the Mills review are as follows. A new compliance assessment model is in use for licensed and permanent sites, which has resulted in improved compliance levels. A number of waste regulations have been introduced or amended, providing the Department with additional powers controlling waste, transport documentation and treatment activities. The fit and proper person requirements for holders of waste authorizations has been revised. Technical qualifications have been enhanced and a broader, broader range of offences are now prescribed. And a review of activities exempt from full waste management licensing was carried out and regulations have been amended to reduce the risk of abuse by operators. I thank the Minister for his answer. And I wonder, could he give us an assessment, his own assessment, of these reforms and if they have been effective in preventing any further incidents of illegal dumping? Well, they're certainly more robust, and uh, one can never be absolutely certain. Uh, that people won't try and cheat the system because there's always individuals out there, uh, particularly where there's considerable money to be made, and there is considerable money to be made at this, um, that haven't uh, continued uh, to try to cheat the system. But nonetheless, uh, I think that this has considerably strengthened things, and we are committed to ensuring that people uh, do not get away uh, with these misdemeanours. I call Mark Durgan. Uh, I can tell you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank the Minister for his answers uh, thus far. The Minister mentioned there the fit and proper person criteria. Could he perhaps elaborate that and, and spell out or outline what steps the Department take to make sure that someone who might have been involved with a company that was involved in misdemeanours and crime cannot then come in in a new company as a director of a new company and get contracts and licences? Well, obviously anybody who has previously been charged would be easily identifiable. Um, so uh, any company that has previously been charged would be easily identifiable. So in these processes, um, there will be a series of things, including their, their um, financial fitness uh, to actually carry out such operations. Uh, so that programme is in place uh, to ensure that they have fit and, and proper persons to comply. Call Meg Nesbitt. The Coastal Forum has enabled my department to collaborate and develop strong links with the Department for Infrastructure and Coastal Erosion Risk Management Issues. The two departments commissioned a baseline study and gap analysis of coastal erosion risk, and this was published in January 2019. The study collated existing data relating to coastal erosion and undertook a high-level vulnerability assessment. However, the primary conclusion from this assessment was that there is currently insufficient data and the results must be considered as preliminary and of insufficient reliability to inform coastal management decision-making. The report made recommendations on how to improve the evidence base, and these have informed the draft coastal work programme. As, this part is, as part of this, a pro project proposal is in preparation for a comprehensive shoreline survey and vulnerability assessment. The Coastal Forum has also prepared a position statement to assist councils with their consideration of coastal change when preparing local development plans. In addition to collaboration between my department and the Department for Infrastructure, the Coastal Forum and its associated working group has provided an opportunity for collaboration with local councils and organisations such as the National Trust, Ulster University, the Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute and Geological Survey of Northern Ireland. And this collective expertise and desire to collaborate on the challenging issue of coastal erosion risk management is becoming very constructive. 
I thank the Minister for his answer and I welcome the establishment of the Coastal Forum. I also declare an interest as a member of the Ards Peninsula Coastal Erosion Group. It is a group which has two objectives. First, to see a replacement of the so-called Bateman formula with a fit-for-purpose policy uh, from the Executive, and also to have either his department or the Department for Infrastructure take on the role as the lead and coordinating department for the Government's engagement in coastal management. Does the Minister support those two objectives? Yes, well, the Bateman formula was approached and endorsed in 1967 by the then Secretary to the Ministry of Finance, um, Sir Cecil Bateman. That ruled that assets along the coastline would be looked after by the respective government department or landowner whose responsibilities most closely coincided with the property or asset at risk from, from erosion, um, which clearly has, has a weakness about it. There was a Coast Protection Act in 1949, which did not extend to Northern Ireland. Uh, therefore, there is no legislation in place in Northern Ireland to specifically address uh, the issue of coastal erosion or assign responsibility for it. So, instead for the past 53 years, um, this has been addressed through the Bateman formula. Um, the approach is essentially a coastal protection policy rather than a coastal erosion risk management strategy. And the objective is simply the protection of property, with no requirement to consider the consequences of implementing and maintaining coastal protection. And Bateman also does not require a joined-up or strategic approach as a consequence. So there has been a lack of leadership on the coastal erosion risk management and no coordinated strategy to consider and address coastal erosion in Northern Ireland. So it is important that our two departments, the DFI and, and, and uh, DERA, work closely together to actually get into the coastal erosion issue. Call Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Thank the Minister for his answers. And I think we do welcome the work that has been done to date on coastal erosion. But there are issues, especially with the high spring tides that we are having, the continuous flooding. Uh, relating to further erosion. Can the Minister advise on what further work is done to possibly identify funding for councils and other agencies to try and address the ongoing problem of coastal erosion, especially in areas like North Down and indeed Arge? Well, coastal, the coast forms part of a, a highly dynamic system, and as such it will be subject periodically to the natural process of coastal erosion. And this is particularly true of the sandy beaches and dune system that are prevalent and we are so fortunate to have in many parts of Northern Ireland. So the management of any given area will depend upon the range of factors such as nature and value of the site at risk, the coastal processes affecting it, and the area's nature conservation interests. And as those factors that will influence the most appropriate response from non-intervention through to the construction of coastal defences. And it is difficult to define um, about best practice recommended methodologies and the materials to be used, as these will differ depending on the, the specific circumstances. My department, as the Marine Licensing Authority, receives applications for construction and development proposals uh, up to the high water mark, and it will consider the factors I have mentioned in the pre application and licensing processes and provide that guidance on the environmental information or reports required to support such an application. I call Jocelyn McNulty. Um, thank you for your, your answers to the questions thus far, Minister. Um, I got an interesting response from Assembly Reyes last week, actually, uh, from the head of Marine Planning. The, the answer came in relation to Armagh's coastline. Between the Victoria Lock on the Omeath Road and Davies Pub, close to Davies Pub, the border close to Davies Pub, I'd just like to ask the Minister, was he aware? that County Armagh had a coastline? Yeah. Not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not as familiar as county, with County Armagh as a member, but I, I do know that it is bounded by County Down, um, County Louth, um, County Tyrone, and uh, there's one other, isn't there? Loch Ney. Well, Loch Ney, but... Uh, <laughs> I, I know it's not, not, not on the sea coast, so, so I don't know how that happened, and, and that is an explanation I'm not able to give at this point. Good try. A call, Sinead Annis. Can call your during yesterday's debate on the uh, FR station, the minister um, spoke a little bit, bit about the lidar survey and the lidar technology, um, and I'm just wondering. Um, 
does the Minister have any plans to use LIDAR, uh, a survey, to, um, to assess coastal erosion and to use uh, this technology in its prevention? Well, LIDAR is a very useful tool and it is something that we intend to use in terms of identifying um, where there is runoff going into um, the, the waters at the coast. And uh, I believe that if, if it's something that could be helpful to us in terms of tackling coastal erosion, uh, then it's something that we should utilise. Um, so if we can gain further benefits from it, as opposed just to water management, um, then that would be something we're very happy to look at. And I call Trevor Lund. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number three. Well, uh, I thank the independent member for Lagan Valley for the question. Yeah. Looking very well in the, in the corner there. Uh, but the current Nutrient Actions Programme regulations for the period of 2019 to 2022 implement a range of controls in livestock manures and chemical fertilisers. The Northern Ireland NAP has been in place since 2007. It is reviewed and revised every four years and applies to all farms. The measures are underpinned by scientific evidence, including local research. Uh, by the Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute. Key measures include a closed period during the winter months when slurry cannot be spread and no spreading when soil and weather conditions are unsuitable. There are limits to how much slurry can be spread, non-spread zones beside waterways and a minimum slurry storage capacity requirement for livestock farms. The NAP for 2019 to 2022 includes additional measures these aim to address pressures in water quality, particularly for increasing phosphorus levels, which have been evident over recent years. Measures include a requirement to use low emission slurry spreading equipment in certain circumstances. And the most recent water quality data indicates that the vast majority of surface fresh waters and groundwaters in Northern Ireland continue to have nitrate levels well below the limits in the EU Nitrates Directive. However, excess phosphorus is the main cause of water quality quality problems in our rivers and lakes. My department recognises the good work done by farmers since the NAP was first introduced in 2007. However, soil phosphorus is often above agronomic optimum, so there is more work to be done on reducing phosphorus inputs from livestock feeds and chemical fertilisers. Ensuring best practice and compliance with the NAP measures will reduce the risk of phosphorus running off the waterways. Trevor Lund, supplementary. Yes, I uh, thank the Minister for that very comprehensive uh, answer. Um, I have no problem with the regulations, but I do have some problems with the enforcement uh, of them. Uh, would, he, would the Minister agree with me that the punishment for careless or even illegal behaviour or transgression of these regulations should be able to fit the crime and perhaps should be more so than is currently the case? Well, in terms of this, it is a matter for the courts, and the courts are independent of the department, um, and the department through the NIEA will take the prosecutions. Uh, so it is not the prosecutor, um, in the case of the NIEA, who decides what people get. And some people have said this, this is a need, demonstrates a need for an independent agency. It's the courts make the decision, not an independent agency, not NIEA, not the department or anybody else. If we're not satisfied, then that is an issue that needs to be addressed um, with uh, the Lord Chief Justice as opposed to the political um, minister. Call Emma Sheeran. If I can, Carlette. I spoke at length earlier about the different uh, challenges faced by farmers. Another factor that makes life difficult for farmers is the calendar. Does the minister envisage that his department uh, is going to have any additional flexibility in terms of the precise timing of, of the open and close season? Relation to sorry, spread. Well, <clears throat> the Nitrates Directive um, was brought in um, as a result of the uh, European Union. And the European Union has a great way of applying blunt instruments to local um, problems. I would prefer to apply local solutions to local problems. So we have just had a month of February where it was wholly unsuitable for spreading slurry, with except for three or four days at the start of it, whilst January was an exceptionally good month and was ideal for spreading slurry. So we want to test this and see what latitude that we have, given that we're still locked into the European Union directives as a result of the protocol. Um, we want to test it and see where we can stretch this, because 
Farming by a calendar only works in an office in Brussels. It doesn't work in a field in County Tyrone, uh, Londonderry or County Down for that matter. And I call John Stewart. Minister for his answers to date, especially around the, the calendar. I think it is essential that we have that flexibility here in terms of farmers being able to do the story in at, at, at suitable times. Uh, we've also got many small farms here and subsequently many fields with uh, plenty of hedges and open drains. Do you believe that the uh, new measures, such as increasing the buffer zones from 15 to 30 metres, is making things slightly more unworkable? Well, of course it will make it uh, more difficult if you have a relatively small field, um, then uh, the, the, bu the buffer um, can create a problem. And uh, some of these drains um, can be dry drains in the first instance, so um, they're less of an issue. Uh, so in all of that, we need to find a way of ensuring that uh, there's less pollution to our waterways, um, whilst at the same time we maximise the nutrients going into the soil. And uh, runoff is no good for either farmers or um, indeed uh, the environment. And we need to ensure that we can actually match the needs. And that's why we're looking at, one of the things that we're looking at is the opportunity of, of, of uh, soil analysis, uh, because soil analysis can demonstrate to farmers what they actually need on the grounds and uh, apply the, the appropriate amount of fertilizer and the appropriate amount of uh, organic manures uh, without overdoing it and consequently that ending up in the waterways. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you. Um, and it's good to hear the, the Minister talk about um, the weather and that farming is dictated by, by the seasons. But given that the climate change is messing up with our weather, weather patterns and, and farmers are struggling with that, um, will slurry spread and be um, something that you're going to be looking at in terms of climate change? Uh, yes, uh, uh, cer certainly it's something that I want to look at and have indicated to my department officials um, that how things are is, is not working and we therefore need to look at how we can change things. So that will be an issue which I don't believe will be straightforward, uh, but nonetheless is one that I'm committed uh, to engaging in a course of work on. I think that we do have uh, an unpredictable weather pattern, albeit uh, our weather seems to operate in cycles, so we get cycles of dry weather and then uh, followed by uh, generally a longer period of wet weather. And uh, ultimately, we need to make the best of it whenever the weather is good, and whenever the weather is not so good, uh, then obviously it's not suitable to be outspread and slurry and so forth. And I think that we must give farmers a little more flexibility um, so that they can actually do a better job of protecting the environment than has been set out for us by the European Union. And consequently, I think that we locally can make better decisions on this uh, than has been handed down to us. Call Melissa McHugh. Uh, Kahara. I'm aware of the difficulties experienced by farmers in the wider rural community in the Sperrins as a result of the flooding that took place in August 2017. As I've outlined previously in response to a question in this assembly, DERA has provided a range of financial advisory and practical support to affected farmers and continues to provide support in a number of ways, including the provision of £500,000 of funding to the Locks Agency to undertake riparian fencing works in the worst affected areas. As regards support to the wider rural community, departmental officials have met with local stakeholders in Plum Bridge to discuss community needs. My department continues to engage in the collaborative work underway through a local growth partnership board to identify key priority actions for the Spurn uh, district electoral area. And I have received de detailed briefings outlining um, Deere's uh, response to the flooding event. The Department of Communities operate a scheme of emergency financial assistance, which was introduced by the Executive on the initiative of the then Finance Minister in June 2017. Its purpose is to provide immediate financial support to households which have suffered from the flooding. Melissa McHugh, supplementary. Uh, thank you, Minister, for your response there. Uh, just, I welcome the fact like, that, uh, that clearly that some uh, initiatives have been taken. 
Um, uh, and when I was mayor of Derry City in Stabana, I actually visited that site as well too, and I can only but describe it as being like a moon landscape at the time. Uh, and I wonder to what extent just has the minister gone forward and providing financial assistance directly to the farmers as of yet, and, or is it likely to happen in the near future? Well, the advice from officials is that the revision of a financial assistance scheme cannot be justified in value for money grounds, nor given the passage of time can a convincing justification be made in hardship grounds. However, I recognise the challenges faced by affected farmers, and this will be a difficult decision for me to make. Therefore, I will carefully consider all of the relevant issues surrounding the matter before reaching a balanced decision in due course. Call Daniel McCrossan. Thank the Minister for his answer to the question, also for the consideration he's given to this and the work that has been done by his department thus far. I know you are taken very seriously, Minister, and I appreciate it. Would the Minister maybe consider joining with me in the beautiful Glenelly Valley to visit a few of those farmers that are affected and just to see uh, firsthand uh, of the impact it's had on that community? I, I will consider it. Um, at a meeting earlier today, uh, it was described by one of my officials not so much as a flooding incident, but as a landslide incident. And we should be treating it as a landslide incident as opposed to a flooding incident. Uh, because large quantities of materials um, slid down into the valley. And in some instances, I think some of the fields were covered with um, over a metre of, of debris. And that was obviously impossible to farm on until you actually made um, those adjustments that, that had to be carried out and carried out at considerable co cost um, to people who perhaps uh, hadn't got the means for it. So uh, I understand all of this. Um, there's just over 220 cases uh, involved here. Uh, some of them were hit much harder than others. Some of them have subsequently benefited from EFS grant aid, which has allowed uh, new fencing, etc. Uh, so it's, it's one of those difficult calls to make, uh, which, which I have to give ministerial direction on, so, so I have to give considerable thought to it. Well, Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In 2016, severe flooding damaged considerable parts of my own constituency, namely at the Loch Shore in Upper Ban, uh, with farmland and rural businesses destroyed by what at that time was severe floods. Uh, and rising lock levels. Now, while I know the Minister's Department does not control the level of the lock, that is with the Department of Infrastructure, um, farmers are looking on at increased uh, rainfall again and noticing the, the dangerous levels of the lock and are asking, will there be um, ministerial uh, co coordination between his department and indeed infrastructure to ensure that the hardship uh, and pain caused to many of those, fa those farmers does not happen again? Um, there lies a problem, I suppose, for, for government in that um, the first scheme is probably the most powerful one, and then the next scheme is just a little behind that, and then the next one, and so forth. And there is a lot of, there's been a, a series of incidents um, beyond just, just your own. I, I recall from Anna a number of years back, uh, but there's been a series of incidents where hardship has been caused as a consequence of weather events. And precedent is, of course, something which is used. So I need to look at all of this um, and, and, and give it all very serious consideration. Um, I, I, I would like to be helpful, uh, but we are custodians of public money, and there's only so much of it to go around. So we just have to be cautious in all of these things. I call Rosemary Barton. Minister, I thank you for your answers so far. Not surprising, I want to speak about Fermanagh and yet more flooding. Um, we've had periods of long, prolonged periods of rain and some of our roads have been covered in, covered in floods and therefore vehicles have had difficulty getting through to farms. Can you tell me, um, is there any compensation, is compensation possible for dairy farmers where, for example, the ta milk tanker hasn't been able to get to the farm for a number of days? Our department doesn't have a particular fund for this type of thing, so each, each matter has to be done on, on a case-by-case -case basis, and where genuine hardship can be demonstrated, um, then that's something that can be given uh, consideration. Um, these difficult weather events are, are something which are going to continue, they're not going to go away, uh, and therefore we do have to be cautious. 
uh, just in terms of how much public money we, we invest in this. Um, we should be encouraging people to have the appropriate and adequate insurance, but I do understand and accept that many insurers will not cover um, quite a lot of these issues. Or Sinead McLaughlin. Extremely hard to very high standards and play a vital role in producing high quality food. The farming industry is also vital to our economy, supports tourism, contributes to rural and environmental sustainability. However, it does face severe financial pressure. Provisional estimates of farm income indicate a 25 per cent reduction in 2019. This follows a similar level of reduction in 2018. Estimates show that most farms, types notably cattle and sheep, have suffered. There is clearly a concern and is not sustainable. I strongly believe that everyone in the agri-food supply chain should share equitably in the risks and rewards. The long-term sustainability of the farming industry depends on farmers receiving a fair return for their work and produce. Encouraging and facilitating dialogue is vital to the overall success of all sectors in the supply chain. The retail and processing sectors have an important role, and I have started to engage with them and their representatives to hear their views on helping farm businesses become more financially sustainable. For the longer term, DERA is working to develop an agricultural policy framework that meets the industry's future needs. My officials are engaging informally with internal and external stakeholders to gather evidence on the challenges and opportunities and practical policy interventions that we can make. It is my hope to lay the foundations for a better functioning supply chain in the course of this Assembly mandate. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, in light of uh, that very stark fall in farm income, 23% in, in 2018 and 25% in 2019, I mean, it's a very challenging environment for farmers. They are being squeezed. And also, in light of the UK leaving the European Union, there are further challenges. What do you intend to do about that, Minister? Well, the, the, we have the, the Grocery Code Adjudicator uh, remit, and it's a reserved matter and a subject to regular review. So, DEFRA and the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy published the UK's government's response to a call for evidence on extending the GCA's remit included to farmers. Analysis of the response led DEFRA based to include that it would not be appropriate to extend the remit of GCA at that time, which is unfortunate. The UK Government did conclude that there is a significant potential to explore more targeted and proportionate approaches to support primary producers. These include the possibility of introducing mandatory written contracts in the dairy sector and mandatory carcass classification and price reporting within the sheep sector. Powers to introduce measures to support fairness in the supply chain are included in the Agricultural Bill, recently introduced at Westminster. So I hope to engage further with other UK ministers um, on these issues in the coming months. I call Catherine Kelly, and we have under two minutes. Has the minister given any consideration to introducing legislation that will guarantee a minimum farm gate price for producers? Um, I know that that's an aspiration that. Uh, some people in the farming sector have been pressing for. I don't think it's a realistic aspiration. Um, I don't think it's deliverable, and consequently, it's not something that we have we have been pressing for. Um, ultimately, we live in a free trade market. Um, we live in a global uh, marketplace, and we compete quite well on it because of the standard and quality of our goods, and because of our close proximity um, to one of the best markets that happens to be available. Uh, which is the, the GB market. Uh, that, that's not without its challenges, and a 23 and a 25 per cent reduction um, in two years running is something which isn't sustainable going forward. So we do need to see um, an uplift in prices um, in the incoming year, and I'll be challenging um, both supermarkets and, and processors uh, to ensure that farmers do get a fair cut of the profitability that remains in the food sector. That ends the period for a list of questions, and I now go to topical questions. I call Jerry Carl. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Um, it's estimated that 24,000 jobs could be created um, by refurbishing and retrofitting homes here. Does the minister agree this would be a worthwhile um, project to take on in order to um, create jobs, but also to tackle the climate crisis as well? 
Um, well, the member talks about 24,500 jobs. Uh, the question is who's going to pay for it? And if it's going to be this assembly, where, it's, where is it getting the money from? And what other areas is it going to be taken from? I have a lot of sympathy with the issue of retrofitting homes because the newer homes that, that, that we have now have tremendous ambient heat and consequently uh, they use very little uh, energy in terms of keeping their houses warm because the houses retain the heat so well. And that's an area, that's a place that we want to go and, and the building regulations are dealing with the newer houses um, and will deal with extensions to older houses as well. Uh, but there are many houses across um, this country where we don't have that standard um, and consequently there's an awful lot of heat loss. So the member raises a, a valid point. The issue is where do we get the finance from to actually do it? Kerry Carl, supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister uh, for his point, and I think um, there's obviously uh, funds that could be made available um, if the will is there, but I thank him for his, his answer. Uh, will he uh, take on to ensure that all the buildings in his department are up to the appropriate standard required so they're not uh, wasting energy or wasting carbon? Well, it's, it's an interesting one that he raises. Um, earlier, Bally Kelly got criticised. It is an excellent building in terms of uh, its heat retention. The Donald House got mentioned. It is an appalling building in terms of its heat retention. Uh, somebody thought it was a wise thing to do to, to actually list it uh, because the heating system is in place. And I think the heating system is one of the most environmentally unsustainable and unfriendly systems that are there. But that's, that's how uh, various parts uh, of, of the department works. Uh, Bill Hardy thinks it's wonderful. Everybody else thinks it's absolutely appalling. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I am happy to, to, to look at that and investigate that. Uh, I think our staff need to be in buildings um, which have um, good appropriate heating systems for the winter time um, and also uh, proper conditions in the summer time when it's, when it's very warm. And uh, we need to be looking at all of this and certainly Dundonald House is the building that I would look at. I call Morris Bradley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I uh, thank the Minister for his, question, for his answer so far. Would the Minister be in support of a wildflower planting project in a bid to encourage natural ecosystems and improve biodiversity uh, within Northern Ireland? Uh, yes, um, that's one of the things that I've actually asked about whenever we move forward to the next tranche beyond the, 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 the current EFS schemes uh, that we could look at. Wildflowers actually uh, grow better on uh, the soils which are not so good. So where the soil is shallower and it's more clay in nature, um, that's where wildflowers actually excel. And it is a great uh, thing to encourage wildflowers. And that is something which um, I would be keen to, to investigate further going forward. Well, Mars Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would think that uh, the use of wildflower planting on lands across departments uh, would benefit insect life, which in turn provide food for other insects and, most importantly, birds, but significantly the most important insect on the planet, the bee. Thank you. Yes, um, I tend to uh, agree with the member, um, and in particular the importance of, of the honeybee, and people very often have taken for granted um, just the, the work that the bee does uh, in terms of sustaining uh, our environment. Uh, I note that in America, because of the growing of almonds and, and the extraction of milk from those almonds, uh, that they have lost around one third of the honey bee population. And that has been done in the name of the environment, that people aren't drinking cow's milk, they're drinking almond milk in the name of the environment, they're actually destroying the environment. So sometimes people need to recognise that um, a lot of the things that they bring forward, and I, I believe Starbucks, for example, uses around a third of its milk as almond milk. Well, Starbucks is damaging the environment, they're damaging the bee population as a consequence of what they're doing, and they should be withdrawing from that almond milk because the bites that comes from the almonds is destroying the honeybee population. Call Sinead Bradley. You, Mr. Speaker, um, could, the min could the Minister give an up-to-date assessment on the potential impact the harsh immigration proposals um, made by the British government could have on the agricultural and fishery industries here? 
Well, at the minute, uh, only around 9% of people who work in the agri-food sector would qualify for uh, the new regulations that are being suggested. I welcome the fact that the regulations have been eased, uh, but there are two particular sectors. One of them doesn't involve my department, but it's the health and social care sector, and the other sector is my department, the agri-food sector, uh, which will be hit badly as a consequence of those regulations. And uh, I believe that that's a battle that is not over. That's a battle that we need to continue to have. And I believe that those two sectors in particular should have a different level than perhaps some of the other sectors. So perhaps engineering and, and um, some of the other areas that people are coming in to do work on um, are better paid jobs. So we need to be looking at those areas uh, where we have a reliance on uh, workers from other countries. Uh, that we actually make it possible for that to happen. I call Senator Bradley, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, could the Minister advise whether he has taken into um, his reading there the reliance on seasonal workers within those industries in the agricultural and fishery sector? And also, could he explain what direct lines of communication he has to the uninformed? Unconcerned, or perhaps both, Prime Minister, who made such proposals. Well, I've raised this at the executive, and the executive are writing um, to the, the government of the day um, to express their concern um, about the issues that are involved. So we need to recognise that it's not just ourselves, but many places in, in England, uh, Scotland, and Wales will be hit as well as a consequence of it. Um, the fishing industry will be hit as a consequence of it. So we need to recognise that there are people who have come from other countries who have sustained many of our businesses, sustained our agricultural sector, in that we have that excellent processing sector, uh, much of it made up of people um, who, live, who, who came from other countries. And it's a bit of a sad reflection in our society uh, that there are many jobs out there and still there are people who don't want to take them up, um, whilst people from Eastern Europe, um, from Portugal, um, from East Timor, from Brazil and other countries um, are only too glad to take up the work that's available here. Call Christopher Stafford. Thank you, sir. Following on from yesterday's very positive announcement about afforestation and the initiatives that the Department intends to undertake in that area, can the Minister outline for us how he intends to engage young people in the process of planting more trees throughout Northern Ireland? Well, I, I think that our young people are, are very important um, in terms of the whole environmental issue. And young people are actually talking a lot about the environment. I would encourage young people not to be getting lifts to school, but to be either using public transport or walking. And that would be more effective than strikes. That's one thing I would say. In terms of planting, I hear a member tut tutting, but can she argue that it wouldn't be better for the environment if there was less cars sitting outside school gates uh, with, with the fumes coming out of them? But in any event, in terms of planting trees, uh, we're hopefully joined by over 500 young people uh, next week uh, as, we, as we commence the programme. And we want to engage uh, with young people, we want to engage with, with the youth population and encourage them to get more involved in our environment, in our biodiversity, um, in our forests and all of that there. So that is part of the programme and we will be working with the Department of Education and others in developing that programme. Call Christopher Stafford, supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In 2014, there was an outbreak of sudden oak death in Beaver Forest. Six and a half thousand trees, 11 hectares, had to be felled, which accounted for almost a quarter of the forest. Will the Minister join with me in visiting Beaver Forest for himself and seeing how the replanting of trees can be facilitated there, particularly I'm hoping to engage uh, Beaver Park Primary School in such a project? We'd be very interested in anything which will encourage young people um, to get involved. So, if the member wants to pass on details, I'd give that my fullest consideration. I call Emma Sheeran. 
The NDNA document repeatedly identifies the transformation of key services as a priority. This needs to properly consider the needs of rural citizens. What steps will the Minister take to remind his department and other departments that transformation of key services must be done in a way that complies with the rural needs duty? Well, it's cross departmental and, and certainly it affects a, a wide range of departments. And I know that DFI have a lot of responsibilities in terms of transportation, ensuring that uh, people who live in areas which are more challenging to reach um, don't lose the opportunity for their medical appointments, um, that their children um, have reasonable access to, to get to schools, and all of those things. So we all have a role to play in ensuring. Uh, that the rural community, which is a very vibrant and vital community uh, here in Northern Ireland, we all have that role to play in ensuring uh, that they can go about their business uh, to the best of their abilities. Uh, bearing in mind that many of them are um, people who are not well off financially, and consequently um, we need to be able to um, support and facilitate them, uh, especially for their key needs. Hemisphere and supplementary. Um, it's important that the Minister and the Department think about your role as a champion for rural citizens. You may not have legislative authority in relation to health, education, housing or justice, but we need departments to move beyond their silos. Would you agree? One of the issues that I have been talking about um, with the Minister of Our Health is rural isolation and mental health issues. And sadly, there are many incidents that happen in rural communities. Um, as a consequence of that isolation that, 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 is, that is happening, where people don't have the opportunity maybe to talk to others uh, whenever they are feeling down and feeling depressed. And, uh, those are all areas that, that we need to be finding solutions to, and that is that's a collective for all of this assembly, uh, for us to work together and to work in the best interests of all of our people, but in this instance, in particular, the rural community. Okay, and I call Dolores Kelly in the nick of time. <laughs> and just, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Minister, I've uh, been contacted by local fishermen who are very concerned at the impact of the recent floods uh, around the Loch Shore, and many of them haven't been able to even get across to their boats. Will there be any help in flood alleviation uh, for the fishing community? Well, maybe the, the member needs to talk to the Minister for Infrastructure in terms of flood alleviation and ensuring that our rivers maybe have a bit more dredging and can take more water away than is currently the case. As we look over in, in England and many of the floods there, it has been because of a lack of dredging uh, that they have reached the point uh, where many homes are flooded. Thankfully, in Northern Ireland this year, we haven't got to that point. Um, but we weren't that far off it just a few days ago. We've had a bit of respite. Um, but were there to be a number of other uh, bad weather incidents, we could be at that point. So we should not be at all complacent. And uh, I will be visiting uh, the area uh, to look at uh, the conditions for myself. Dolores Kelly with one minute left. Uh, Minister, uh, 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 to have a look at that. But sorry, will there be interdepartmental uh, you know, working and some collaboration across departments, given uh, the importance of the uh, fishing industry to uh, Loch Ness? I, I know the importance of the eel industry, and uh, there used to be a, a feller. Yes, when I was previously in decal, reminded me very often about it. So uh, I know the importance of the eel fishing industry. Um, in, in that area, and uh, of, in fact, uh, the, many people want to, want to acquire that product, so they do, and it is a, a premium product. So um, I understand that the fishermen need to have the opportunity to catch that very high-value uh, commodity. The time is up, and could I ask the member to take a raise for a moment of a change of table here?